Hey, Brody. What's up, man? What you doing? Hey, man. Brody? You all right? Yeah, it's just that, man, you know that Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny comes out this Friday, right? Let me guess. You read them shitty ass reviews, didn't you? I know you did. What'd you say? No, 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 no. What? My big mouth. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just move on. We'll go ahead. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, is it weird that I've known Indiana Jones for almost as long as I've been alive? You know, like I, I grew up with him. I, I bonded with him like he was a real life uncle or some shit like that you know I, I i watched him get all them girls up in them college with being a teacher and rescue kids from a voodoo sweatshop and drink jesus juice and even gave him emotional support after being manhandled by extraterrestrials and after all these years now i gotta say bye to him yeah that shit's weird dude it's weird as fuck i mean it's almost psychotic yeah. what the fuck oh Oh, fuck. Look, I'm going to go ahead and tell you how it is, all right? You remember when my Aunt Jemaya died? No, how the fuck would I know who your Aunt Jemaya is? Like, yeah, motherfucker, look, we ain't got time for all that shit, all right? Look, I mean, social media, my nigga, damn. All right, I know, all right, I remember, sure, sure. Yeah, all right, look, look, my ass was fucking sad for three fucking years, you know? Like, she was the only one who gave a damn on my birthday. She used to send me these little cars, put five, ten dollars in it. Like that shit meant to a lot to a nigga when he was young. You know what I'm saying? Damn, man. Yeah, that's real love, fool. Yeah. And then one day I got hit and woke the fuck up. What with sudden clarity? Nah, man. My uncle Dave, they slapped the shit out of me. Slapped me in the next week. Look, he I mean he got tired of me. I was crying and complaining about his ex-wife and you know, my auntie, my favorite auntie. And he was trying to move on and date younger bitches, and well, I was just fucking up his game, you know? I just kept yeah. talking about my, my auntie, his dead-ass wife. Oh, my God, bro. People that you love and the people that loved you, I mean, you're going to mourn them after they die, right? Don't be ashamed of your tears, you little bitch. They deserve that. You know something, Zach? You're right. There you go. That's the spirit. Indiana Jones and Steven Spielberg and George Lucas multi-million dollar franchise. I mean, they must have, you must know several people of, of yours that are friends that, that want to mourn them with you, right? Yeah. I mean, like, I mean why don't y'all all get together, sing like Kumbaya or, you know, have like a little candlelight visual, play some of their best movies. You know, don't let them just die in, in vain. Celebrate their life instead of mourning it. Green? Super green. Yeah. All right? Cool. Whoa, 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 hey, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. Where, where, where are you going, man? You just talked me into this whole thing. You're not going to come to our services for Indiana Jones? Me? Fuck no. What? I mean, look, all right, yeah. I've, I've seen all the movies and, yeah. I enjoyed the fuck out of them, but look, I got no connection to that nigga. Like, what? No. no. Look, I mean, look, do you remember the black girl that uh, he's in, that Indy smashed? Um, uh, uh, what about the time uh, he fought for black equality? Did you remember that? Well, um, uh, 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 I, 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 what about the, the one black friend that he has? Come on, you re you remember? Remind, remind me. Uh, uh, what, what about uh, uh, what about Sala? What? Sala? Sand niggas and Brooklyn niggas ain't the same. Oh man, I remember him telling me that shit too. Dude, John Reese Davies wouldn't last five fucking minutes in Compton. Spielberg, he had to make a whole new movie to make up for the lack of diversity. The color purple. Hello, nigga. Remember that? 
I look, I don't know if he got his DGA card for that, but I know the brother got his black card. You know what I'm saying? Well, before I go, how about we smoke and, and, and listen to some some Indi- some Indiana Jones score, mix some John Williams in there and shit. How about a mix called Fuck You, Master? Look, I ain't your monkey playing shit. When you got a film buff live on Bad Boys or the Friday series, then we can talk. All right? But until then, I'm going back to my Fresh Prince marathon, baby. Zach, mm, where'd you come go? Back to bed. See, at least someone around here gets it's not the years, it's the mileage. Where'd hey, you go? don't forget to bring back the whip. Shut up, bitch! <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Good evening. Thank you, friends, family. Tonight, today, we will be celebrating the memory of Henry Walton Jones Jr. And here lies Henry Walton Jones Jr. Nicknames and aliases go by the names of Indiana Jones, Indy, Jr., Henry Defense, Mungo, Kidogo, Captain Dynamite, Scourge of the Kaiser, and Jonesy. He has four professional titles, a doctor and a PhD, professor, a capitan of the Belgian Army, World War I, a colonel of the U.S. States Army, World War II. He's had several occupations, United States Army officer, the OSS, historian, and linguist, college professor and an archaeologist. He is the son of Henry Walton Jones Sr. and Anna Mary Jones. He is the brother of Susie Jones. He has two spouses. His wife Marion Ravenwood Jones. He has three children. Sophie Jones, daughter, Henry Walton, nicknamed Mutt, William Jones III, son, and for those who are keeping track, he is the surrogate father to Juan Short Round Lee. Henry Indiana Jones, the native of Princeton, New Jersey, was introduced as a tenured professor of archaeology in the 1981 film Raiders of the Lost Ark, set in 1936. The Joneses are a family of paternal Scottish descent. The character of Indiana Jones is an adventurer reminiscent of the 1930s film serial Treasure Hunters and Pulp Action Heroes. His research is funded by Marshall College. It's a fictional school named after producer Frank Marshall. He is a professor of archaeology. He studied under the Egyptianist and archaeologist Abner Ravenwood at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. Jones is characterized by his iconic accoutrements, bullwhip, a fedora, satchel, and leather jacket, wry, witty, and sarcastic sense of humor, deep knowledge of ancient civilizations and languages, and fear of snakes. Since his first appearance in Raiders of the Lost Ark, Indiana Jones has become one of cinema's most famous characters. In 2003, the American Film Institute ranked him the second greatest film hero of all time. He was also named the greatest movie character by Empire Magazine. 
Entertainment Weekly ranked him second on their list of all-time coolest heroes in pop culture. Premier Magazine also placed Jones at number seven on their list of the 100 greatest movie characters of all time. In his role as a college professor of archaeology, Jones is a scholary, wears a tweed suit, and lectures on ancient civilizations. At the opportunity to recover important artifacts, Dr. Jones transforms into Indiana, a non-superhero superhero image that he has concocted for himself. Producer Frank Marshall said, and it quotes, Indy is a fallible character. He makes mistakes and gets hurt. That's the other thing people like. He's a real character, not a character with superpowers. Director Steven Spielberg said that there was the willingness to allow our leading man to get hurt and to express his pain and to get his mad out and to take pratfalls and sometimes be the butt of his own jokes. I mean, Indiana Jones is not a perfect hero and in his perfections, I think, make the audience feel that with a little more exercise and a little more courage, they could be just like him. According to director Steven Spielberg biographer Douglas Brode, Indiana created his heroic figure as to escape the dullness of teaching at school. Both of Indiana's persona reject one another in philosophy, creating a duality. Harrison Ford, the actor who portrays Indiana Jones, said the fun of playing the character was that Indiana is both a romantic and a cynic, while scholars have analyzed Indiana as having traits of a lone wolf, a man on a quest, a noble treasure hunter, a hard-boiled detective, a human superhero, and an American patriot. Marcus Brody acts as Indiana's positive role model at the college. This week, the year 2023, we approach what we are told to be his final adventure with the Dial of Destiny, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it because he would not want that. The reviews are dismal and the outlook is negative. But tonight is not about his end, tonight is about his entirety. Welcome to Film Buff, live here on Film Buff. I'm your host, William Patrick Coleman. And today, we celebrate the life and creative death of Indiana Jones, who some consider to be the greatest movie character to ever exist on celluloid film. In honor of his memory, we have five guests tonight to here to speak in tribute. Some of you will recognize our guests and who have appeared on here before as film enthusiasts. Others are new and we welcome them with open arms, but make no mistake, they are here with the extensive knowledge and undying love and passion for the great, one and only, Indiana Jones. I'd like to introduce my first guest from our Academy Award episode, film enthusiast, Andy LaLama. All right. Yeah, we're back. You guys remember Kai Meyer? How are you? My beautiful co-host, actress Ame Khan. <laughs> New to the show, fellow actor, writer, director, John Douglas Williams. Hey, buddy. And for those of you who are keeping track, we have a very, very special guest, director William Van Chuck, who some of you might recognize to be the director of our Film Buff Season 1 sketch, Agent 232. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Absolutely, sir. Now, clearly, if you guys are all here today, you know, uh, Andy, of course, you are an Indiana Jones fan. Over 40 years ago, the adventure started. Indiana Jones fan, we're all in the right place. Yep. <laughs> love. Uh, but yeah, no, I've loved Indiana Jones my whole damn life. You, Cara, you wouldn't be here if it was uh, Downton Abbey or Fast and Furious. You'd be about a month late, right? You're an Indiana Jones fan. Or Huge fan. It was one of the first like super like action movies that I can remember seeing. It was like Indiana Jones and Star Wars. Harrison Ford in both, you know. And it was one of those where you you really recognize that they were able to tell a story through action scenes. You know, it wasn't just something that looked pretty. It wasn't just something they slapped up on a screen. Like you were genuinely getting, you know, character development, story driven, you know, stuff happening within those scenes it was so cool like stuff does not live up to the kind of action sequences that you see in indiana jones huge fan can you tell me a moment that uh, indiana jones has impacted your life i also have great memories of it because i used to watch it with my grandfather and he he introduced me to indiana jones series of the films and i i loved it i loved the adventure how did you feel the first time you saw an indiana jones movie was it raiders was it temple of doom my dad uh, my parents were divorced and you know, children are divorced and pretty common with Spielberg things in the eighties. Um, my dad would come every other weekend and my dad is awesome. I love my dad, but we'd go and see a movie. That was one of our things. That's one of the reasons I so infatuated with the movies. I was working in movie theaters at the time. I, hey, I worked at a movie theater too. 
became general manager of an AMC theater at 24 and worked there till I was 30 and then quit and went to acting school in New York City. We're going through the paper and we're looking at that point, you literally pull up the newspaper and they have the full page ads of every thing that's out. And we were talking about what to go see. Go see. And one of the things he's like, well, what about this one? You want to see Raiders? And knowing that I'm a giant Star Wars fan, and I honestly did not recognize at that point that Han Solo and Indiana Jones were the same person. And I went, yeah, it looks all right. I was among the generation who saw Temple of Doom and Raiders back to back, like side by side. They were equally as good. Oh, I actually think that... Uh, I had seen Temple of Doom and The Last Crusade before I ever saw Raiders. Most most actors and my filmmakers, I think, from the age of 30 to 65, that's the moment the when they knew they wanted to be in show business, is watching that movie, I think. I kind of would say I'm a hybrid. If you asked me to order them, especially once we got to three, I would have definitely went one. I think Raiders is the best one. I think Raiders still stands out the strongest. I think in some ways it's just so... It just hits all those beats perfectly in order. Like when you were what, when I watched it in the theater, even when I watch it now, you just like on to the next ride, on to the next ride. Let's, you know, we're moving yeah. on to the next, and it just flows. The first one I love because it's the first of the whole thing. So yeah. I automatically respect it. As a whole, I think Raiders is the better movie, like the better film. And I really love Raiders. The childhood nostalgia thing with me. The ball dropping scene was a getter for me that I was like, oh, I'm hooked. I don't know what this, who this character, the opening of that whole thing was like, wow, who is yeah. this? You know, and that was before I even knew who Harrison Ford was. It was about the character. Marion Allen is amazing. Marion, I feel like is someone that, you know, we all kind of have that person that floats in and out of our lives. And, you know, they were the person that, you know, really kind of, you know, uh, sits there and rent free in your head as, as the young ones say. I think that Marion is, the quintessential girl that got away, you know? Not even the girl next door, she's the girl that got away. And then Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom would definitely have been in third no matter what. No matter what. So if it goes watchability, I will watch Temple of Doom a million times. If you go, let's watch Indiana Jones, that's the first one I'll turn on. It was the first one that I fell in love with. I loved the dynamic between Indy and Short Round and-, and Really? have an appreciation for Temple of Doom. Really being that person that just kind of gets shoved into this. I feel like she's the one that as someone who isn't an archeologist, is not an adventurer and everything like Marion was, you have those moments where, you know, like going down the, the, the rapids and, you know, just trying to be a performer and, and, you know, doing what you need to do in order to be famous. And it's kind of what he's doing too, but she's doing a different capacity and, you know, uh, having to ride an elephant, uh, which I've done before, which is really fun. Um, you know, she's one of those people that her genuine reactions in this entire, you know, uh, adventure are so, um, raw and and relatable that i feel like she's the one that everyone kind of grasps to you're actually the first person i've ever heard ever say that they like willie scott uh she had to marry the director to save her career no, i'm just kidding the end of that movie when the little kids come out, little kids get freed and come out and they swarm their their parents it's just a joyful moment and i think every Every parent, anybody who's who loves another family member can identify with like getting their family member back. Really a beautiful moment. Temple of Doom didn't really scare me, although reflecting back on it now, being the PG-13, being the movie that spawned the PG-13 rating. Do you know that Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom was the first movie to create the PG-13 rating? Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah, that was, because I was running movie theaters at the time. Yeah, it uh, it came out PG, and then parents had complained about it, rightfully so, rightfully so. They called it back and created this whole rating system uh, with PG-13. I think Gremlins had a hand in that also. I remember having to, uh, you know, trick myself as a kid, you know, because it was scary, you know, and, and try to, you know, you know, look at things more humorously. And uh, I, I remember that, you know, I don't know if it was from 
you know, maybe my older brother or parents or somebody, you know, was trying to sort of, you know, put it in different frames so it wasn't as scary. The monkey brains alone probably is, you know, get you a PG-13 rating. Especially things like, I don't know, a bunch of dudes getting ripped apart by alligators. Like, that's traumatic for a child to watch. I believe George Lucas had apologized for Temple of Doom, uh, associating it with a uh, divorce he was going through at the time he wrote it. I don't know what that means, but... But my favorite is... Um... Uh, uh, the Last Crusade. Hands down, without a shadow of a doubt, Indiana Jones: The Last Crusade is the one that speaks to me the most. It's it's borderline a perfect film. However, writing wise, I would say that Last Crusade is probably the most witty. The pacing is amazing. It's absolutely hilarious. Favorite is Last Crusade. It's got the best storyline. With a very close follow of three of Last Crusade. You have twists and turns. But I lean more towards the third one, which is The Last Crusade. The pacing of it is so good. It's like, what, a two hour and what, 15 minute movie or something? It does not feel like it. Every single moment of that movie is incredible. I like it as a storytelling aspect to it with uh, Sean Connery as the father. Such a good relationship with him and Sean Connery. The casting of Sean Connery as his dad was just perfect. Of course, of course, James Bond is Indiana Jones's father. I loved Sean Connery. Just when you thought that Indiana Jones it couldn't be played to the height of his excitement, it, you know, as exciting as he could get with Temple of Doom and Raiders of the Lost Ark and the uh, reputation he's had with those, the very second that Sean Connery walks into frame, from that moment on, the two of them elevate Indiana Jones into a completely different level of adventure and excitement. I would go as far as to say this is probably one of my top five Steven Spielberg films of all time. I could have seen a couple more movies with them together or a large yeah, series or something. Cool. He is a bit of a burden on the journey of solving this cup situation, but at the same time, he solves so many problems along the way that Indy was incapable of doing. Um, and my favorite is when they're on the beach Yes. And the plane is coming and he starts flapping the oh, umbrella. Uh, when he uses the umbrella and the bird for the other. Yeah. And, the, you know, and the plane crashes, you know. I remembered my Charlemagne, you know. It's... <laughs> and the birds <laughs> in the sky. Yeah, they're just like, da 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 It's like, okay, yeah. It's like... One of my favorite moments in the movie when they're together is when he's in the back of the plane, you know, and he's with the, he's with his, his, his propeller, you know, gun. Machine gun, and follow the plane to the, <laughs> to the tail section. <laughs> when he shoots <laughs> across the back of the plane. Yes, and what's Four great is... Than, uh, they got, they got us. <laughs> Can't even admit to him the like, hey, I'm sorry. More or less than sorry, uh... Right. <laughs> they got us. They got Deep us. Blue. I tried my best. Sorry to go. Whoops. They're in the, the Nazi castle, basically. And my favorite is when they're back to back tied together in the chair. And they're tied up back to back and the, the fire starts. That whole scene, like the, the turn and the, the, the spinning fireplace. Amazing, yes. amazing bit of comedy in a very tense moment in the movie. Dad, what? 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 You can sit there and go, but that would happen. That would 100% happen in a scene like that. It puts that reality kind of thing to it. It makes it so relatable. I think when you're watching these movies, you know it's all going to come out in the end the right way. But how are they going to get out of this situation in this particular moment? Do you understand where? Where? How do you know? You don't see it coming when you are in the film, but once you realize that they both had gotten the girl. She talks in her sleep. <laughs> and the, the grotesqueness of that where you're like, what? No, no. The second that moment happened, I was like, she's a Nazi. She's not. As much as they love each other, they're both, so, both, both also compete with each other in some way. And the fact that Indiana yeah. Jones is just like the rest of us, where we have one parent, we're like, oh my God, I love you. I will always love you, but damn it. The opening, I thought River Phoenix was great as young Indy. The late great River Phoenix really showing his chops because you know, <laughs> there's no denying that he was an incredible actor. Oh but yeah, he he's fantastic. On the younger version of Harrison Ford, like, and, and this was a point we already had, like, regarding Henry and all the, you know, all these other roles that he played that were so very good. 
But when you take on something as iconic as Indiana Jones, like couldn't couldn't get a better like just had the right energy and the 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 passion for what he was doing, like truth, just in it, truth and justice, the American way, but in an archaeologist yet to be formed, you know, um, and uh, chasing after that cross in the beginning of the film was just so great. And then it turns out everybody's again. I was actually talking to William uh, Van Chuck about uh, the character in Indiana Jones in the opening, um, the, the gentleman that gives him the hat that's a, is apparently Marion Ravenwood's father. Uh, uh, okay. Indiana Jones looked up. To I mean, I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll double check with Bill, but I believe he's the one that told me that. So The guy with the fedora and that, no. He's a common criminal. Oh, I see. Oh, all right. Thanks, Bill. Uh, I'm your host, William Patrick Coleman, here on Go Fuck Myself Live on Film Buffoon. Yeah, it was one of his professors in, uh, I think, like, he's supposed to have went to University of Chicago originally. And he was one of the professors there. So, and that's where he meets Marion, which we want to talk about that. Like, it's a little fuzzy in the age age thing there really cool when yes. he gives they didn't have to do that but it's no. a little charm it's a little charm to the to, okay. to it I, I think it's great the snakes you understand like where so much of that kind of comes from but it also sets that basis of relationship of why he works so hard why he does what he does why he you know is seeking out fortune and glory it's because that's what his dad did and he because they had that tumultuous relationship he's got to be better you know, I felt like there was more lightheartedness. It wasn't as serious as the other two movies. They all have jokey yeah. moments, and you know, they they have their level of comedy. But uh, Last Crusade, I thought, was the funniest. Um, so, like that one, kind of sticks out for me. We named the dog Indiana. <laughs> we named the dog. <laughs> a thing that really I found interesting, and I just watched this movie in anticipation of having this conversation with you, um, and I never saw it before. And I've seen this movie. I don't know. 12 or 15 times i i don't remember but um there was a moment in the movie when um when the character walter donovan uh he's like the bad guy who's working with the mm -hmm. nazis he's played by uh julian glover a guy named julian yeah. glover, who had a, a really nice career and i think he's still alive actually in his 80s or 90s um, yeah julian glover he's still working in fact he was just he just made a random appearance in the willow show like blink and you miss him you, you couldn't even tell it was him they get to the point in the movie where uh, they're, there's, they're in this fictitious Middle Eastern country and there's a sultan who is the ruler of the country and they're negotiating with him to let the Nazis and Walter Donovan go look for the cup. And, uh, and they bring over this chest and they open the chest and there's all this gold trinkets in there. Like, yeah, yeah. Teapot, teapots and chains and what whatnot. And the Walter Donovan character says, some of the, these are items donated by some of Germany's finest citizens. And it hit me in the last watching of this movie that that was a reference to the Jews who had that stuff stolen from them, which I had, oh, would make sense being Steven Spielberg. Also. Yeah, of course. I never saw it before, but you know, when, when you know, when you first see it when you're 24, or 30 you're not lit, lit you know you're not thinking in that worldview um but now with age and and more knowledge of history i'm like spielberg was saying something there you know really very clever, clever actually super clever and really very subtle understated way it wasn't he didn't hit you over the head with it but he wanted to he wanted to say something about nazis be, beyond the fact that they were in search of of this cup and everlasting life. Speaking of Willow, the actor that plays General Kale pops up once in every single Indiana Jones movie uh, as a fighter to Indiana Jones. So in the first one, uh, he's the guy at the plane, you know, that gets chopped up with the propeller and then the Temple of Doom, he's the big one with the boulder hidden in the children and he's beating Indiana Jones down and the voodoo doll, you know. Um, Pat Roach, I believe, is his name. It was literally a, a Temple of Doom video game. Dude, I remember the old 
uh, NES Nintendo game of Last Crusade, and I used to love playing that. There was it's one of the first films ever to have a video game in an arcade based on the movie. It was like a little puzzle, like a um, sliding tile puzzle to, to show the picture of the grail, you know, and you had to complete that early on in the game. And where uh, uh, Kalima says, Kalima will rule the world in the video game and Indiana Jones is doing this adventurous stuff to try and save the kids in the, in the video game. And, and then at the end of the game, when you had to pick the grail, you literally picked one, you know, choose wisely. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. You had to match the, the picture. So if you couldn't figure out the picture early on, then you might not pick the right one at the end. Cause that's, you know, little things like that. It was such a cool game. We've always been really fascinated by archeology, span anthropology, sociology, all that stuff. I ace those classes. If I wasn't an actor, I'd probably go into that field because I find it so fascinating. Now that we're a little more culturally aware that appropriating other people's artifacts is not right. You know, these movies don't are not as smooth politically as they were when they first came out in the 80s to learn about new civilizations or old, you know so in a series i mean the civilizations we come across um and then learning about that through the art of storytelling i think that was like a mind-blowing experience i was like i want to do that you know that's so cool if you go to peru for example as an archaeologist and and dig a site and find the stuff and then leave all of the artifacts with the Peruvian people. I'm totally cool with that. But to go to Peru and then take all that stuff and drop it in the, 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 just take it, just to take just it from its it for the, yeah, but even dropping it in, in your own museums in in the Brit British museum and the museum of natural history in New York city, that's, that's not appropriate anymore. And, um, and we know that now, but we didn't quite grasp that when these movies came out. Um, and I think these movies actually helped educate us culturally worldwide. That, that stuff's not appropriate. But the memory of my grandfather and I watching it over and over is always like close to my heart forever. So it's a very special one for the third one for me. Which antagonist is the most threatening for Indiana Jones? His ultimate adversary. This one, this one's kind of tough. Obviously, I, I have a fondness for Belloc. I just think he's great. I like, I mean, like instantly, I thought of the the German officer, the general guy in Last Crusade. Uh, you know, the one that last battle with him in yeah, the yeah. tank, and he goes over the edge. You know, uh, yeah. But obviously, Nazis as a whole are probably as a whole, yeah, or adversary. And the best adversary for him because they sort of went against everything that he wanted to believe should happen. They weren't doing it for the right reasons, you know. But Molaram is such a cool badass ripping people's hearts out. So I don't know. Probably a coin toss between them. I might have to land on Molaram just because, you know, dude's insane. I can't believe they, they bring the Nazis back over and over. Nobody I know. Yeah, here we go again with the Nazis, right? Guys, which they are, and <laughs> Indiana Jones is kicking their fucking ass. There's nothing more American than Indiana Jones fighting Nazis. Hey, Nazis definitely are are the reason, but people that don't take it seriously, in in the sense of like they don't care about it for the right reasons. And it just happens to be the Nazis tend to be the ones he's fighting. I mean, it's like Gloria Bastards or. Um, Plansmen. Yeah. Those are hard topics because they're very real in our world, unfortunately. But that's the beautiful part of the art in the story is highlighting that they're fucking stupid and we want to make fun of them how stupid and He's fighting hate. they are. You know, like that's the comedy behind it. And, and thank God we have that at least. And he's fighting hate in a moment of like, yeah, before flower power found itself. Right. You yeah. know, and so like that's kind of a, and it's really cool, and it's, and I'm definitely oh, all yeah. about seeing it again. Uh, I thought Doctor Snyder in that movie was a really interesting uh, casting choice. Allison Duty, who uh, you know, I looked her up recently. <coughs> she um she's had an amazing long career. She's been in lots and lots of stuff. I always liked her. She uh I like the actress. I but in this movie, the first the first act of this movie, she just felt so stiff and unconnected and 
I couldn't figure out if that was intentional or if she was being directed to do that. I feel like Elsa is one of those people that you can't really relate to. If I had to pick a weakness, I didn't, I didn't love her as a casting choice. And I remember when I first saw I didn't see it coming. So I, yeah. I mean, I'm a child. But The name Snyder was an easy giveaway. You almost know from the beginning she's going to be a bad guy. They set her up really well. And you're like, you know that she's going to be the, the, the villain, the thwarting, you know, kind of person. It's still... Yeah. It was like, oh, this is new. And she ends up being a Nazi and you're like, nah, done. Like not even, you know, in any stretch of the imagination. She was a double agent as well. I think he's relevant because it's just that craving for adventure. I, I think, you know, you all, it's the same reason we like some of the movies in the Marvel Universe or Star Wars. It's, it's that adventure that you're going on. And... Andy has given us a fun ride pretty steadily since he has come out. I mean, you know, he's an archaeologist and that's always interesting, you know? So, you know, these stories are kind of timeless in a way because they, they you know, they take place in the past. So it's already a period piece, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, uh, you know, that search for the unknown is relatable in any time period. And, you know, and obviously all the Indiana Jones movies throw in supernatural elements, which make it more fun and interesting, you know, whether it's, you know, ripping people's hearts out or aliens or what have you, you know, there's always mm -hmm. some sort of supernatural element that uh, that he's facing as well. And I think that sort of combination of, you know, reality, real archaeology and fantasy uh, goes really well together. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with something that he is sort of an everyman, you know, and I think that's where you get a lot of action heroes that, you know, at some point they turn that, that, you know, page or they turn that corner where they go from someone who you can relate to that you can go like, I could see this happening. It exists within the real world to these like superheroes, you know, they did it with John McClane. They did it with, you know, a lot of different characters that, you know, sort of grew within that where suddenly he's jumping out of helicopters. They make mention of that on the office, you know, stuff like that. But Indiana Jones, consistently ends up being that same guy he gets older but he's fallible he makes mistakes he slips and falls and has to himself be saved it's not just about him swooping in and so i think that's something that you know besides being an explorer and being able to go all these amazing places and have all this you know incredible knowledge and he's a school teacher and he's this it's something that someone can relate to but then go like i could do that you know and it's really cool it's like i'll learn how to use a whip and then i'm good like that's it that's his whole superpower indy was an archaeologist because he loved it and he wanted to know things and you know i'm a knowledge guy i love information and learning and i've never stopped learning in my life and um and while he was a nerd a science nerd and it, uh he was also an adventurer and those two things are very rarely co combined in in the motion picture arena and and he uh and at the same time there's moments where they show the things that he's afraid of like snakes and um Makes and, him very vulnerable. Yes, of course. And, you know, and that's the thing about Spielberg. He he really knows how to put the right polish to make all the different parts identifiable, identifiable to the audience. That's my feeling about that. I feel, uh, like there's, I feel like there are two characters in cinema history that have really perfected this. Uh, the action hero, Everyday Man, which is... Which is which is Indiana Jones and John McClane. These are guys that uh, will fall down ten times before they get up once, and they get up once, and it's really big. But they'll they'll you know they're human. Yeah, I I agree, I, I agree with that assessment. Actually, um, uh, it's it, 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 it's funny because you know when you look at 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 a more modern take on those kind of uh, on 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 the John McClane character, John Wick. Look at John Wick, right? He's he's like a Terminator dude, right? It's not believable, right? But you can believe John McClane's character. We lose Steven Spielberg, and I was kind of heartbroken about that. But when I found out we still have John Williams, you know, I'd be willing to settle. Plus, James Mangold has a very impressive resume. Uh, Logan, Walk the Line. Ford versus Ferrari. I mean, none of these movies you could tell were made by the same guys. So it's it's a very interesting project to hand over to him. Music. <laughs>
it gets me every time too. Like I'm, I'm dying to want to, I just, I've always wanted to go to the Hollywood bowl and hear the orchestration. I went to that. I went to, I went to that actually the first year that I moved to LA. Uh, you do know this is the first Indiana Jones we have. That's not directed by Spielberg. Well, you know, he's sort of, I think like me, somewhat retired. Yeah. Uh, he, he, he does produce it and he supports it, but thankfully this is, not the first Indiana Jones movie where John Williams is not scoring. He is returning to score. And to me, that's, that's everything. That's and all then, I really Yes. Mean. Listen, uh, you know, it's one of the joys of my early life uh, of working in movie theaters and wanting to be an actor is sitting in, in the movie theater and watching my name, John Williams show up on the screen. Um, and then I got to do that with my own actual real name, which is John Douglas Williams. And that was kind of cool. So, yeah. And I, I want to thank you, John, for, uh, uh, taking the time to come back out of retirement to contribute, uh, you know, to this installment of Indiana Jones. Thank you for coming <laughs> back for that. Thank you. Yeah, we're all very, very grateful for that. Can't wait. But that music with the visuals and all the acting and everything, all that magic, classic. It, yeah. It's in your body. It's in your heart. It's in your mind. You you can rewatch it over and over again because that's how good it is. Did you see the thing? From the premiere, where it was like um, Stephen up there talking, and Mangold's up there for for the new one, and they're saying, you know, obviously there's three people we can could have never done this without with, and it's like George because George who created it, um, Harrison because Harrison embodies Indy, and then they opened up the screens and like in John Wayne, he's the heartbeat, hero, and John yeah, his orchestra back there, and they oh, played the. Oh, I didn't see that. Is that online? Oh, yes, it's online. Oh. No matter what, and it's completely selfish sounding, no matter what, this movie is for me. It is for me to rap and to see it because I love Harrison Ford in this. I love all these movies have meant so much to me, even the one that I don't like as much, where I've, I've even watched the young Indiana Jones Chronicles because I was so into that, that, you know, and, and so I'm like, no, 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 it, it, no matter what, one, I don't think it can be as, in, 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 like I said, Crystal Skull, I love the first half of that movie. And then from that point on, it sort of lost its way, but there are still moments within that portion down the line that it touches where it needed to get to. And, you know, so I think this is, no matter what, I don't think it will be as, I don't wanna say that one's bad. I mean, it's not great, but I don't think it's, I think it will still be better than what that one was. Okay, least favorite for sure is Crystal Skull. I think that's most mm -hmm. least favorite. They lost me in, in that movie when, uh, when he, he, he's, uh, swinging through the trees and there's, and he's got a, a pompadour haircut and oh, Mark Williams, uh, Shia LaBeouf's character. Yeah. And, uh, Shia LaBeouf's character has like a pompadour and then there's monkeys swinging in the trees next to him and they have the exact same haircut and I just it kind of lost me and I was like all right I, this movie's okay but it's not it's not the same standard as the other two I won't use this platform to talk crap about movies really but I will say um, clearly it does not hold a candle to Les Crusade nor the other two see the other two installments but King of the Crystal Skull, however, proves that Indiana Jones is the first series of a bunch of number of installments to have the best openings ever. They, they don't have one bad opening, including King of the Crystal Skull. Its powerful, most powerful moment is in the first 15 minutes in Area 51. What's your favorite creepy crawly moment of Indiana Jones? I still can't even really watch um, the uh, uh, Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. Uh, Temple of Doom, the bugs. Uh, and they're in the room with the closing ceiling, and she's reaching in, and like when Willie is reaching her hand in, oh, it, God. It, it, crawling up her fucking back, and the no, I can't crying, you know, and he's like, "We are going we to die. die," you know, and it's like, like, like no, "Your other left." I do not like bugs. I hate insects. You know, yeah. with, with Indiana Jones and his snakes, and uh, and his father with rats. It's me with bugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the humor comes in. It's such a tense situation. And then no. doesn't move away from that tense situation. You can see yourself in that moment going, no, that's exactly what I would do. And like, he's, 
gross thing coming out. Look, crawls through her hair. Oh and, um, God! I'm like, get him up! Yeah. Like I don't, uh, I, I don't do bugs. It's not my thing. And that, I that scene still, I can't watch the whole. I can't do snakes. I won't do it. I won't do it. If you told me right now there's one fucking snake in this room, but I'll never see it. It'll never come in contact with it. It'll never cause me harm. I will still burn this fucking house to the ground. I'll burn it to the ground. I cannot fucking stand snakes. Well, I'll end this uh, wonderful episode dedicated to the great Indiana Jones series by saying thank you to George Lucas, Steven Spielberg, John Williams, and of course, Harrison Ford for bringing us such a lovable character uh, over the past 42 years. Thank you. Well, I can't thank you enough for being on today's show, our Indiana Jones special. Uh, next time we talk, we will be having a conversation about how we felt about the Dial of Destiny um, and our send-off, our proper send-off to our beloved Indiana Jones portrayed endearingly by the great Harrison Ford. Thank you so much, Andy, for being on the show. Hey, brother. Bye. Namaste. Namaste. Later, Bill. You're the best, buddy. My time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so All much right. for being on. See you later. Bye. Right. Bye. Yeah, I will talk to you after uh, after we see this movie. I think I got this map behind me here so I can find my way home. Hey guys, I do want to do a special thank you to everybody who's tuned in to watch our Indiana Jones and the Great Film of Farewell episode. I want to thank all my guests who have been on. Ame, Kyla, John, Douglas Williams, William Van Chuck, and of course, Andrew Alama. The eulogy I performed earlier today was taken directly by the website of Wikipedia so that there are no factual errors. And I do not take credit for what was written about the character. And thank you for tuning in. We've got a lot of exciting announcements coming up in support of our new Patreon page that we're going to begin at the last week of July. Please stay tuned to hear some of the fantastic gifts and prizes that we're offering along with, as well as what comes with our Patreon page that you can only get exclusively there and not anywhere else. Stay tuned.